Well, thank you very much indeed for having me. I will share my screen and get started. Okay, so what I would like to tell you today is our most uh, recent work um, on the mechanism of coronavirus replication. Now, the coronavirus has, as you know, an RNA genome, very long RNA genome, and it encodes for a polymerase that can duplicate this genome. And you may wonder how we got into all of that because Actually, our laboratory is focusing very strongly on the mechanisms of cellular gene transcription. In particular, we study the mechanism of RNA polymerases in eukaryotic cells and how they interact with the dozens of different factors uh, that they bind um, to express the human genome. And also we're interested in the process of regulation of gene transcription. And for this, we actually combine integrated structural biology with biochemistry, so in vitro approaches, but also we use um, in vivo approaches, uh, in particular functional genomics. And of course, um, bioinformatics is the glue that brings things together and enables us to really study mechanistic questions uh, in human cells. So, you know, when the pandemic hit us, we were wondering how we could help. And we thought that our expertise in studying polymerases um, would be important in order to understand the replication of the coronavirus genome. And so a team got together of people who didn't work together before. They would be working on very different projects. And we decided that over the next weeks, um, we would only concentrate on that problem and maybe we could actually solve the structure of the coronavirus polymerase and understand how it's replicating the RNA genome and also to understand hopefully the mechanisms of inhibition of the polymerase by antivirals. And so here are the heroes who actually got this to work within only a few weeks in an extremely competitive situation as you can imagine um, with Chinese laboratories who had a jump start. Uh, in that project. So Hauke Hillen, Christian Dienemann, Goran Kokic, Dmitry Tegunov, and Lukas Farnon. Uh, and they have very different complementary expertise ranging from biochemistry all the way to cryo-electron microscopy and uh, processing of data. So it was a great team um, to work with. So why is um, this process of replication important and why is it of biomedical interest? I would argue that it's one of the three um, mechanisms that the virus uses that can maybe most effectively be targeted um, by drugs. One would be to block the entry of the virus and people are doing this with you know, antibodies, nanobodies. Uh, another one, I think we will hear about that is to inhibit the protease which is required to cleave um, the coronavirus protein precursor into functional units. And the third one would be to inhibit the polymerase and thereby stop replication, but also impair a transcription because it's actually the same polymerase that carries replication and transcription in coronaviruses. And, um, you know, does that make any sense? I think it absolutely does because, you know, it's very hard to predict the future, but um, provided on the past, it's very clear that uh, you know, inhibition of the replication of the viral genome is something that really works in other systems. So here are a few examples. You can block hepatitis C virus RNA synthesis, or uh, in HIV, you can block the reverse transcriptase, which is also a polymerase. Um, and um, of course, the herpes virus is blocked by cyclovir, which is a polymerase inhibitor, and remdesivir, which you all know, which is now in the clinic um, and has been um, approved for emergency use in the US and now also approved in the U European Union. It's also a nucleotide analogon, which uh, inhibits the polymerase of various 
viral um, viruses, you know, hepatitis, Ebola, um, but also the coronavirus polymerase. So how did we go about this? Well, first of all, we made the polymerase. It turns out you need three proteins. They're called NSP12, NSP8, and NSP7. And you need to make a functional complex of these. We achieved that by a combination of co-expression and reconstitution. And then we used the minimal template that you see here. It's basically just a synthetic RNA with a fluorescent label at the 5 prime end. And if you give that to the uh, polymerase and you add nucleoside triphosphates, then the RNA is extended by the polymerase in the three prime direction. And you can see here very nicely that uh, very rapidly you obtain the full length RNA product when you add all three proteins in a functional complex. So we had everything in place and now we had to use cryo-electron microscopy. There were quite a few obstacles which I won't have time to go about. Um, but uh, just for those who are not familiar with this, um, we use very large electron microscopes, this so-called CRIOS microscope, and this is at cryo temperature. So you freeze your sample, you image millions of individual particles, which are in the range of nanometers, and then you average them. And if you can view them from different directions, you will be able to reconstruct the three-dimensional volume uh, and which corresponds to your structure, and that can then be explained by a chemical model. So here you see these densities for the polymerase, and in case of the active center where the RNA template and the RNA product are found, we actually achieve very high resolution, maybe around two and a half angstrom resolution, but then external regions are very flexible and poorly resolved. So here's an overview of the uh, structure that we got. You see the different protein subunits in different colors, NSP7 in green, NSP8 in blue, and then various colors here represent different functional domains of the larger NSP12 protein, which actually contains the active site of the polymerase, which is symbolized here with a magenta sphere. Uh, the blue strand is the RNA template, and the red one is the RNA product that the polymerase uh, is synthesizing based on the template. And here's the first movie of coronavirus replication that we obtained from this work. It's very much simplified, but it gives you an overview if you're not so much familiar with um, polymerase function. So nucleoside triphosphate building blocks are entering the enzyme from the right here. Then they bind in the active center, and uh, then there's a phosphodiester bond formation catalyzed by the enzyme. So the RNA chain is extended by one nucleotide. And then what follows is what we call translocation. So the polymerase, through some movements that we don't fully understand, is able to push both the DNA, the RNA template and the RNA product forward. And this frees the binding site for the next NTP substrate. You can also see that there's these long green extensions here. We call them the sliding poles because they slide along the RNA product. And that is a very important feature in our structure that was not seen by the three Chinese um, competitors, at least not in, in full extent. So you can see how competitive the project was. Um, we published in Nature in April, and another group published in Science just you know, a few weeks before us, uh, and then also in May, and there were papers from other Chinese groups in, in, in Science as well. Um, and some of these groups also um, reported RNA in the active site of the polymerase, but these RNAs were much shorter, and we were lucky there was some some serendipity involved that we got a long rna into our complex and this actually stabilized these extensions in the subunits nsp8 there's two copies uh, of that subunit and these so-called sliding poles are uh, unique uh, for nidoviruses so you only find them in polymerases of coronaviruses and other nidoviruses you don't find them in polymerases of hepatitis, poliovirus, or norovirus. Um, and we think the reason is that the coronaviruses have extremely long genomes, about 30,000 uh, nucleotides of RNA. These are the longest RNA genomes that are known. 
And you must make sure that the polymerase stays attached to this very long genome during your application, because if it would fall off after synthesizing half of the genome, you would have to restart. Um, and we think that these uh, sliding course, this particular feature is important for processivity of the polymerase, um, so that the polymerase stays attached to the genome. Finally, what about the inhibition? That's something for the future, but what we can already say is that the uh, nitrile group at the ribose ring of remdesivir, this is the, the distinguishing feature of remdesivir, this can actually fit into the active site. We see that by modeling. So the prediction is that remdesivir triphosphate, which is the active, um, active um, compound in the cell, uh, which results from metabolizing the pro-drug remdesivir, that this remdesivir triphosphate can be used as a substrate instead of ATP. And then remdesivir is actually incorporated in the RNA. And this we see here, this is my last slide for today. Uh, we see here biochemically very beautifully. So on the left, you see that the uh, polymerase, when you give it an RNA template and all the four nucleoside triphosphate substrates, it can very rapidly uh, synthesize until the end of the template and you get a full RNA product. But when you replace ATP by remdesivir triphosphate, and this is done here on the right, you would suddenly see this intermediate accumulating. So you can still, after some time, get the full length product. So remdesivir is not able to completely block the polymerase, but it stores the polymerase after the incorporation of four nucleotides. And this is a very special mechanism that you don't have for the other antivirals. And that is thought to allow the polymerase to escape from the proofreading. Uh, and so remdesivir is not cleaved out because it's incorporated and then the polymerase is still moving forward by several nucleotides and that actually uh, enables the drug to escape uh, proofreading and resistance. And so this is a very intriguing mechanism that we're now studying. So we're solving now structures on the path to the inhibition by remdesivir. So we will get a movie um, and we will see how the polymerase gets stuck when remdesivir is incorporated and hopefully this will allow us um, to make some suggestions for better drugs, uh, better inhibitors of coronavirus replication. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you for your wonderful presentation. I uh, uh, will allow a few questions. We have time for that. There is one by Patrick Bone he, who says, uh, impressive illustrations are you now also studying how nsp14 the 3 prime 5 prime exonuclease is interacting with the complex yeah this is a brilliant question that's exactly what we would like to do um, because these enzymes as you know um, are uh, catalyzing the exonucleolytic proofreading so they would cleave out um, normal antivirals that would just get incorporated and then make the polymerase stuck. They would also, um, or this proofreading exonuclease would also uh, cleave off mismatches from the end, from the three prime end of the RNA. So misincorporated nucleotides can be removed this way and we would love to understand how this works. So far we can make the proofreading complex, which are these two proteins uh, and it's active. We can see it's a very nice nuclease, but we so far, we cannot make a stable complex with the polymerase, which would be required to really understand how proofreading works. But, you know, if it was simple, it would be already done. And so we will keep trying. Yeah. Thank you very much. I see no further burning questions. And in the interest of time, we can move on to the next speaker. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Professor Freeman.